so that we can have this for our, um, our YouTube uh, as well. So, so yeah, so here, let me share screen so we can go to our Mishkan Tefila here, starting with the beginning of the Seder Kriyat Torah. Seder, of course, meaning the order, uh, Kriyat, the reading or the calling of the Torah. Uh, and this is the one that's done on Shabbat or on Shabbat. Uh, so that's what this means right at the top, Seder Kriyat HaTorah Shabbat, the order of reading the Torah for Shabbat. And we start with the song, Ein Kamocha. And we can take a look, see at the English here. Uh, there is none like you among the gods, Adonai, and there are no deeds like yours. You are sovereign over all, over all worlds, and, dom and your dominion is in all generations. Uh, Adonai reigns, Adonai has reigned, Adonai will reign forever and ever. Adonai will give strength to our people, Adonai will bless our people with peace. Now, for those familiar, of course, with our Torah service on Shabbat evenings, uh, you know, we might start singing the song, which I think is, Ken, you, you're usually the solo for this one, I think. Uh, I can be myself or Terry usually, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, so you know that uh, we usually start singing, and then as soon as we get to the Adonai Melech, Adonai Melech, that's when we usually stand up. So although it says the Ark is open and remove the Torah right at the beginning, we usually wait till we get into it a little bit. Um, but yeah, so, so, so that, any thoughts just on this translation that we have for the Ein Kamocha here? Well, I was looking at the Hebrew for the word worlds, and it is plural, isn't it? It is all, uh, yeah, olamim. Olamim. olamim, yeah. So I guess, I guess the rabbis understood that there's other worlds other than ours. There is a, uh, a teaching that comes from the, uh, the first few words of the book of Genesis, uh, because in Hebrew, uh, it says, uh, we see Bereshit, which is usually translated in most texts that you would see is in the beginning. However, Bereshit is not Bereshit, and Bereshit is actually more in a beginning. A beginning. Yeah. Uh, so it would be more of an understanding of perhaps other beginnings, other worlds, and things like that. I'm not. I, I don't think this is the you know the the rabbis or the writers of this uh, this little uh, song here saying you know the multiverse theory. Uh, but uh, it's uh, it is interesting that you're right. It does say all worlds instead of. It's not the whole world. It's all worlds. All worlds. Yeah. Is heaven Following considered? Up on what Ken just pointed out, there are also more than one God. Yeah, we definitely see that as well uh, in, in different uh, in different prayers too, uh, and this one as well, uh, as it says, "In Kamocha Ba Elohim Adonai," as there is none like you, Ba Elohim, among the gods, uh, God Adonai. And who is this attributed to? I know most things tend to be attributed to David, but you know, at what point in time was this prayer adopted, or do they think it was written? So, so it's uh, so it's, as it says on here, this is an amalgamation of some different psalms. So it would be attributed most of this to David, but kind of taking different parts from different psalms for this. But definitely, as we know, psalms are very much kind of very praise God psalms. I mean, there are psalms that have different things in different times. Uh, but that's definitely, if, if I said, what's this psalm about? And I chose any one of the 150 and you said praising God. I would say yes, uh, but maybe there would be a little bit more to it than that. But usually you're right if you say yes, it's about praising God. <laughs> is, is heaven considered part of this world or is that another world? So that could be about where it's from, saying kol olamim is both the ha'aretz, like the earth, and hashemayim, the heavens, uh, as the two there. However, there is an interesting way to plural something if it's just two, uh, and that would be with, instead of an im, it's an aim. Um, uh, let's see, a, a good example of that. Uh, what is a good example of that? Uh, <laughs> Actually, Jerusalem in some ways, although we're not sure exactly what the two is, but Yerushalayim is actually an example of that. But also just the word two, Shtayim, uh, has that same, uh, that same kind of ending. It's not im, it's ayim. There's a special just for two, the number two, uh, if there are two of something. Oh, a reglayim, uh, legs. 
uh, or yadayim arms. Uh, it's uh, if you're if you're just referring to the two arms or two legs that we have, it's that. But if you're if you're speaking about more than that, like all of our yadayim together, all of our two arms would be yadim. Uh, but so so I would say that this would imply with the the im ending more than just two of the heaven and the earth. Mm. All right, but here, why don't we go to this Av Harachamim. Source of mercy, favor Zion with your goodness. Rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, for in you alone do we trust, sovereign, high, and exalted God eternal. Now, we talked a lot last time about how during Shabbat, we don't say the petitioning prayers of the Amidah because God deserves a day of rest as well. However, some of those petitioning prayers are about build, rebuilding Jerusalem, and we do have that right here as well, even though it's on Shabbat. So some of the, the parts of the prayer service are not as consistent, I suppose. Um, all right. Uh, usually we're standing up in the sanctuary at this point. Uh, this is just, as we've seen in the Mishkan Tefillah, we usually have kind of the more traditional prayers and translations on the right, and then some kind of either alternative translations or prayers uh, on the left side of the page, which is, which is this side of the page here. Uh, but then we get to this part, and this part is, is I think, actually very interesting. Ki mitzion tetzei Torah, udivar Adonai Yerushalayim, for from out of Zion will come the Torah, um, in the world of Adonai from Jerusalem. Uh, now I say that's interesting because if we know our story correctly, where does the Torah come from? Because it's not Mount Zion that the Torah comes from. It's Mount Sinai. I know. Uh, so, so this, this kind of, uh, yeah, this, this kind of phrase here that we have from out of Zion, and it is, it is understood to be Mount Zion, uh, will come the Torah and the word of Adonai from Jerusalem seems to have been written as an understanding a, a little bit, um, uh, here it is from, uh, this is coming from Isaiah, uh, coming from a time where, you know, Jerusalem was definitely the central power of, you know, the Jewish people. Uh, the professor, actually the professor that I had in biblical criticism uh, in rabbinical school uh, said that the the, the writings that are talking from Zion are actually might be uh, a little bit older than the ones that are coming from Sinai, as Sinai was a, a later development showing that there could be a people after the exile from Jerusalem. Uh, that's that's, that's a, still a pretty far out theory um, uh, in, in I think the academic world, but, uh, but David Aaron, uh, who was the professor had at that one. Well, rather than an individual place in, in the first line, might it be referring to uh, the region of Zion uh, in general, and then comes back to the, to the, the, the city of Jerusalem as a further de definition? Yes. So, so, so Harvey, I think you're, you're very right. This is a common poetic device that's used in the, uh, in the Hebrew Bible, where it says something, and then the next line, it says a very similar thing, just with different words. So, so yes, and, and we can actually use that to help better understand the first or the second thing. So, yes, from out of Zion will come the Torah, the word of Adonai, which, again, is, is this understanding of the Torah from Jerusalem, also similar to, to Zion. And it's this, it's, it's called the, the fancy word is a chiastic structure, starting with a place, or like in this case, it's, it starts with a place, then talks about the Torah, then the Torah, then, oh, you can't see my hand pointing. Uh, here, let me use the mouse instead. Uh, starting, from, uh, starting from a place, then the Torah, then the Torah ending with a place. So kind of a, uh, 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 yeah, a structure there uh, that's happening uh, with, the, um, with this line from Isaiah. How, how do you... How do we explain the future tense? Will come. A uh, good question, Tate. Suppose who has has come, or has been given. Uh, so, or? so I, I guess this is also uh, well. So 
uh, in Isaiah, this would be a prophetic statement uh, of, uh, of Isaiah first understanding that the Torah did come from, uh, you know, come from God, uh, you know, come, coming from Jerusalem. But Isaiah is also talking at a time where it's, that's not what's happening. And it's saying that this will happen again. Ah, okay. Okay. I have a question. This is more just kind of out there. I mean, what are the chances or, or whoever wrote this that the Torah itself, the actual physical words on the page, so to speak, would come from Zion, but the understanding of those words come from, few, you know, from people in Jerusalem. Like the, the interpretation, I guess, would be a way to. Oh, so, 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 so that's. I, I think that's a good, uh, a good thought, at least, and it definitely uh, in understanding that interpretation is very important when it comes to Torah, and that's something that's that's I think pretty much been true for for uh, forever. Uh, it even says so in the Torah that we're going to need to interpret this. Uh, it's not just uh, the, these answers are not just uh, you know inherent in the in the reading. They're going to take some thought uh, and some uh, some interpretation. All right. So here, let's take a look. See at our, at our next line here. Uh, lift up your heads, O gates. Lift yourselves up, O ancient doors. Uh, see, we see, we hear kind of that that same uh, that same thing here, saying something about the gates and then the ancient doors. Let the sovereign of glory enter. Who is the sovereign of glory? The God of hosts, the sovereign of glory. Uh, and then we usually say after that, uh, although this is just the, the first or the second half of it, in the scroll is the secret of our people's life from Sinai until now. Uh, it's teaching is love and justice, goodness and hope. Freedom is its gift from all who, for all who treasure it. But interestingly enough, this is something that uh, we see more in, in, in the reform prayer box. Uh, but when it says in the scroll is the secret of our life from Sinai until now, here we hear Sinai instead of Zion or Mount Zion from here. Uh, but so, so far we haven't even, or actually we, at, at Eitz Chaim, we've taken the Torah out of the ark, uh, but we have not yet uh, laid it down. So there's, there's a lot of kind of um, preliminary things that are hap that, uh, that need to happen to, uh, before we can even start uh, reading the Torah. Uh, and then we get to this part, a few blessings now that, 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 that we see. Um, blessed is God who is holiness gave the Torah to the people Israel. Uh, so, uh, so I just, uh, a, yeah, a quick, uh, you know, quick thing about, you know, Torah being given to the people Israel. And then of course we recognize this, uh, we've said it already, uh, in the service here, O Israel, Adonai is our God, Adonai is one hearing the Shema again, uh, at this part in the service as well. And then Achad Eloheinu, Gadol Adonenu, Kadosh Shemo, our God is one, Adonai is great, holy is God's name. Uh, and then uh, exalt Adonai with me, let us extol God's name together. Uh, and then into the Lechadodi or the Hakafa. Uh, and we can take a look at the English of the Lechadodi as well. Yours, Adonai, is the greatness, might, splendor, triumph, and majesty. Yes, all that is in heaven and on earth. To you, Adonai, belong sovereignty and preeminence above all. Uh, and we usually, this is the Hakafa song uh, that we sing as soon as we start marching the Torah around the congregation. Uh, so what do you think is the significance of marching the Torah around the congregation? I think it's showing that the Torah is not meant just for the priests that is something that is meant for the people to see and to study and to adore. I, I think you're exactly right, Ken. This is, it, it, is, it is shown to be, it needs to be treated with reverence, but it's something that is for everyone. The Torah is for everyone. And, uh, uh, and at least in progressive congregations, everyone who's there, um, everyone who's Jewish that's there is gonna be able to kiss the Torah um, 
and uh, and and you know, kind of uh, yeah, as as we bring it around uh, the congregation. All right. Any other thoughts about kind of these? Uh, these prayers and blessings that we do and psalms that we do before uh, we even get to the Torah reading. Yes. Um, if you compare the traditional prayer book with the reform with Mishkan Tefillah, there are some things that are omitted from Mishkan Tefillah. And I wonder what's the process by which the, the, the editor, what's the process by which you get agreement on what you should drop out? For example, um, a couple of pages ago, uh, the prayer, our prayer book uh, said, God, the Torah will come forth from Jerusalem. And I think that in the uh, traditional prayer book, before that, it, you pray for God to scatter our enemies and smite our foes. And then the Torah will come out. And so I wonder what kind of discussions go on relating to what's dropped and what's kept. So it's so a great question, Alan, uh, and things that seem to be antithetical to kind of the reform understanding of the world, uh, you know, are sometimes dropped, uh, especially something like that, uh, you know, about, you know, the, the, the enemies of the, of the Torah being destroyed before taking out the Torah is something that, that, yeah, I think goes against a lot of reform values. Uh, probably also some allusions to a Messiah or even a Messianic age might also be taken out uh, as well. What Rabbi, what is, what is the thinking that the, the Shema is said a second time? So, uh, so from what I understand, it's actually a practical reason in that is um, people don't get to the synagogue uh, early to get to the first one. <laughs> okay. It's uh, it, yeah, it, nothing uh, really more than that. Uh, uh, it's same thing with, uh, although we hear the, the Baruch Hu at the beginning of Shema and its blessings prayer, uh, it's a, um, we hear it again, of course, with the blessing that we do before the Torah portion. So different parts of the service that we've already heard in some ways. Uh, there's also another Amidah that's done traditionally after the Torah service on Saturday mornings um, called the Musaf uh, or just the additional Amidah. Uh, as a way of making sure that everybody gets, you know, everybody gets to say it, even if you didn't uh, even get there. Uh, all right. Uh, so there are also other songs, of course, that we can sing uh, as well. Al Shlosha Devarim, of course, is a, is, is a, uh, a particular one that we love at Eitz Chaim. Uh, but we like Roman Lu as well. Uh, but a lot of, a lot of different songs that, uh, that are good. Al Shlosha Devarim coming from Pure Kea Boat, uh, which we did talk about in our Talmud class. Uh, all right, so now we get to our Torah blessings. So we had a whole bunch of prayers, blessings, and psalms uh, before even taking the Torah out of its cover. Uh, but everyone stands up as soon as we open up the ark again to kind of show this reverence. Another way of showing reverence to the Torah is making sure that there's some sort of barrier between you and the Torah uh, when you when you kiss it. It's uh, it's one that uh, we either do it with our talit or our sidur, uh, so we don't uh, not getting kind of our the the oils from our hands onto the Torah as as these scrolls are very old. I mean the we're having our Wheaton Shabbat on Friday night. Uh, and there's a little controversy, I think, in exactly how old the Wheaton Torah is. Uh, if I remember correctly, I think they, they said it was like something like 500, 600 years old, uh, but it's probably only a few hundred years old, but okay, that's okay. The, in any event, they're, they're old. Uh, and, uh, and one way to keep them nice is to make sure that we're, uh, you know, not, not needlessly touching them, uh, that there's some sort of barrier between us and the, uh, and the Torah. 
Uh, but yeah, but here are the blessings. So, uh, so now before reading the Torah, uh, we hear a blessing. Uh, and on Shabbat, traditionally, there are seven aliyot. Uh, so the Torah portion is divided into seven sections. Uh, some, if, if you're doing the whole Torah portion, those seven sections will take up the whole Torah portions. If you're doing the triennial cycle, where you read only a third of each Torah portion each week, then those seven will be, of course, just over a third. Um, but traditionally, the aliyot are done in a certain order. The first one is done by someone who is a Kohen, uh, someone who's from that family of, uh, of you know, who, who is from the, you know, the priestly class of the Kohanes, and not just the priestly class, but the, you know, the elite of the priestly class and the Kohanes. Uh, then the second aliyah is done by the a Levi. So someone who, a Kohen could do that one as well, but it could be also just any Levi. Um, and then the third one is, is any, anyone from Klal Israel. Uh, and then the, uh, after the third one, uh, the other ones are also anyone, uh, anyone just for, uh, anyone who's Jewish could come up and do that, uh, that Aliyah. Now in Reform Judaism, we don't really care about that at all. Uh, in conservative Judaism, they do, but they're okay if the Kohen or Levi are, are, are women from the, from the Kohen or, or Levi family as well doing the Aliyah. Um, but in Orthodox Judaism, that is something that's still kind of cared about uh, that. Uh, and it's not impossible, you, even if you, because they, they recognize there are realities where you might not have a Kohen or a Levite in, uh, in the uh, congregation at that day uh, so that they can't do the Aliyah. So there's something that you say, Bemakom HaKohen, which means in the place of a Kohen, when you call them up to the Torah. But usually when we call someone up the to, to the Torah, we say either Ya'amod or Ta'amod, depending on the gender of the person coming up. Uh, and then we say their Hebrew name, uh, and then La'aliyah HaTorah, or to give an Aliyah of the Torah. So I know a lot of you have, have been called up to the Torah, uh, so you may have heard that as well. And then we have a blessing before the Torah that we know, of course, blessed Adonai who is blessed, Blessed is Adonai, who is blessed now and forever. Blessed are you, Adonai, our God, sovereign of the universe, has, who, has cho who, was, who has chosen us from among the peoples and given us the Torah. Blessed are you, Adonai, who gives the Torah. Uh, now, definitely, if you asked for a theme of this blessing, it would be blessing, uh, as the word bless or baruch, or some variation of baruch or baruch, uh, hamavorach, is, is a word that's chosen a lot uh, if for, this, uh, for this blessing. Uh, we also have a, an interesting difference that the Reconstructionist tradition is gonna have something changed here that none of the other denominations have, and that's this word bachar, uh, which means chosen. Uh, here it says, who has chosen us from among the peoples. That idea of chosenness is actually taken out of Reconstructionist Judaism, and I forget what they replace it with, uh, but that is a difference that we have between, that's actually Orthodox and Reform are the same, but Reconstructionist is a little different. Uh, and, uh, and then we read the Torah. <laughs> uh, so any questions or thoughts just from that explanation about the, uh, about the Torah blessings? What was, what was the logic of them, the Reconstructionists removing it is because they thought it was, um, Elitist? It's, it, I believe it has something to do with that. I forget exactly what Mordechai Kaplan, uh, who kind of the founder of the Reconstruction Re Reconstructionist Movement said about that. So I'm moving to the other room so I can plug in my computer. Um, uh, uh, so I, I don't exactly remember why that's the case, but I think it does have to do with something, the understanding of chosenness being a difficult uh, or a, uh, a, um, an issue in Reconstructionist Judaism uh, that, uh, that they chose to say that that's not among their values. Okay, the question I have also is when it says among the people and given us the Torah, could it be among the people by giving us the Torah? Is that a possible translation? Or is it definitely above? So, so I'm sorry, can you say that one more time? Okay. <clears throat> so it says, who has chosen us from among the people and given us the Torah. If and was by giving us the Torah, it wouldn't make it elitist. 
I don't think, in my interpretation. So, 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 what's, uh, what's, yes. the Hebrew? what's the Hebrew? So, so, it, so it is that, which is usually translated as and, but yeah. uh, especially that, but a lot of the uh, prepositions or conjunctions or disjunctions uh, in Hebrew can sometimes mean something else. Um, so by instead of and could definitely be an interpretation of this. I like that better. <laughs> I'm, I, I like that one too. <laughs> uh, so I think it's also important to note in the kind of rhythm of the whole service, we uh, in the reading of the Torah is kind of the height of that service. This is the time, this is like, this is the big moment. The apex of the holiness of the service is happening right here during the Torah service. Uh, which uh, it's, it's kind of, you, you know, it's, it's, it's usually sort of kind of like the middle, uh, maybe a little bit past the middle uh, here uh, in, uh, in the service. Uh, and it's definitely one that is, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's supposed to be kind of the, the height. Uh, and since it is the height, we do certain things, uh, ask God for certain things um, uh, during, uh, during this time. Uh, so uh, we'll skip ahead a little bit, but uh, uh, we'll take a look here at the Misha Berach, uh, of course, which is a big part of this tour service. We usually do this part right here, of course, the Debbie Friedman version. Um, but in asking for the healing of the sick uh, is, is intentionally done at this point, uh, as well as our prayers for the community or for Israel. Uh, is done at this point as a way of this is the time that God might be listening the most. So we have perhaps, this mutual. Perhaps there's a related question. Um, in, in the concluding blessing over the Torah, uh, you say, Bechaye Olam, and it's translated as who gives us eternal life. And sometimes that's, that was withdrawn in another part of the service. And I wonder what meaning is, what meaning accused, accrues to these words? So, so it's a good question, Alan. And, and we did, uh, if you remember from the, our Amidah discussion last time, we talked about how in the Reformed tradition, we changed the idea of giving life to the dead. Uh, the idea of eternal life, however, is not as resurrecting the dead and the idea of eternal life, we could argue might be referring to the same thing, but eternal life, especially in progressive Judaism, is also an understanding of memory is that we have our, our, you know, kind of eternity through, through the memory of the next generations and the impact that we had in the world today. So I think there's a little bit more uh, interpretation or a little bit more, uh, you know, wiggle room in that interpretation of the Chaye Olam uh, or, or, you know, the giving of the eternal life uh, than there is in... Um, uh, resurrecting the dead that we have. That's pretty much exactly what that means in the Amidah. But, but that is a good question, Alan. And actually, why don't we go over this? Because I don't think we did this, uh, the, the after blessing. So after we read the Torah, we do a blessing before. We also do a blessing after. Uh, Blessed are you, Adonai, our God, sovereign of the universe, who has given us a Torah of truth, implanting within us eternal life. Blessed are you, Adonai, who gives the Torah. Uh, also, the implication here with having the chatima or that sealing part, uh, the end of the, the, the blessing, the giving of the Torah, that it's through the giving of the Torah or our studying of the Torah that is the, uh, the importance of um, the important, that, that's, that's where the eternal life comes from. It's the, this idea of studying Torah, not perhaps, you know, a more understanding in the, uh, in the more orthodox circles that that's what's going to get you to the world to come. Uh, in progressive circles, more of this idea of that, that study and doing good is going to be able to have our memory live on forever. I, I think it's interesting that it says the Torah of truth. 
by saying the Torah of truth, it implies perhaps that some would think there are untruths in the Torah. And this has to be emphasized that the Torah is totally truthful. Yeah, I, I think that it, it's an interesting modifier that we have that Torah should just be implied truth in it, but needing to have that Torah to met, uh, that Torah of truth is, is an interesting way of saying that we, we know that this is true. All right. Any other thoughts about our, our Torah blessings here? I think that this issue, I, I think the reference to eternal life is not, is not necessarily uh, implanting that attribute um, uh, as a person as it is that the, the Torah will be with us eternally. So that could, uh, so, so yeah, let's, uh, so v'chaya olam natap v'tochinu, in life the eternal, I think that could be an interpretation of that as well. I, I think the rabbis knew about DNA before we did. Uh, that's, it's, I, I mean, an understanding <laughs> of how uh, the next generations are similar to us uh, you know, I already see, I, uh, you know, I'm already hearing, of course, the Matan looks like me, uh, which I'm happy with because he's adorable. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, we can, we can see that. Of course, our generations live on. For, for those, of course, uh, but, but it doesn't have to be, of course, just in, in our, uh, you know, people that, 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 that we've, we've sired and raised, but also just in our, in our words and understandings and our, our impact that, that people can follow as well. All right. Um, so yeah, so, so then as I was explaining kind of the height of the service is this Torah service. So the Misha Barak asking for healing uh, is definitely something that we want to, uh, to bring about here. Uh, let's- Can I ask a really quick question? Sure. Before Mishkan Tefillah, the, the previous versions of the, the Sidur, did they always have the Misha Barach at this time? Because I kind of remember in the back of my head that it wasn't here in the service, or did we do it in a different part of the service? You know? So I, I, I don't know the answer to that since I've only been around since you've been using Mishkan. Okay. Uh, so I'm know. not sure. I don't know if Alan or Ken or anybody remembers, like, long ago, and I'm talking probably 25 years plus ago, that the Misha Berach was done in a different part of the service. I don't remember when I grew up the Misha Berach being done at all. Okay. I just remember it being like after the Torah was put away, after everything was all done, like right before we did the Kaddish, we did the, the this. So I just thought it was kind of strange that they stuck it where they did. It, it's also... Yeah, it, it right. to know that. Oh, sorry. No, no, I was just, I was agreeing that I, I think it was later in the service, uh, not directly associated with the end of the Torah service. And looking in Gates of Prayer, it, um, it is not put on the page after putting the Torah away. Yeah, that's what I remember, is towards the end. It is also important to note that the Misha Berach, we do the Misha Berach for healing, but there can be a Misha Berach uh, for lots of things. Uh, the, this is the, the prayers for healing, which is the Misha Berach, but a Misha Berach is really just a way of someone getting an extra, an extra blessing. Uh, so people who are going uh, you know, on a journey, uh, traveling somewhere, especially to Israel, we might do a Misha Berach for someone off to college or something like that might get a Misha Berach. Uh, there are lots of different reasons why, why someone might, might get a Misha Berach. It's just- well, I, I think, you know, what Elise is, is referring to is years ago, before we honored those who have passed, we also asked for healing. So it, it was much later in the service. I understand. Uh, oh, well, that's right. 
So, uh, but usually after the Misha Berach is done, after the final Aliyah is done, uh, we do this. Uh, this is the Torah, which Moses placed before the people of Israel, God's word through the hand of Moses. Uh, and when we do that, we lift up the Torah. And in another example of the Torah being for everyone, uh, we have the Hagba who turns around. Uh, and, you know, traditionally you have to see three panels of the Torah, but it's pretty much to show you, uh, to show the people not just, uh, you know, that what was just read was what was read. It's supposed to be like, okay, that's, yeah, that's what it says. Uh, that's what I heard. Everything, everything's okay. <laughs> Uh, is, uh, is an important part of this idea of the Hagbah. Uh, and then the Galila who comes and helps uh, dress the Torah and we get it ready for, um, uh, to be put back uh, into the ark. Uh, now there is, uh, so, so for rolling a Torah, it's not something that's usually uh, done uh, during Shabbat, but there are other times throughout the year where there might be an extra Torah portion that's done on Shabbat. Different holidays uh, can change, uh, can make it so that there's an additional reading. The, the, the kind of the rule of, uh, the rule is that whatever is done most often is done first. So the Shabbat reading would be done first. Uh, but for instance, if Shabbat falls on Rosh Chodesh or the beginning of the month, there is a special reading that's done that would be done after. There are two times throughout the year that Shabbat could fall on a Rosh Chodesh. And there's also another special thing that's happening that would make it so that there's even a third reading. Uh, and traditionally when that's done, uh, you'll actually see three Hagba and three Galila, uh, Galilas come up and dress and lift different Torahs. Um, that can happen on Hanukkah. Uh, because Hanukkah goes across two months, starts in Kislev and ends in Tebetz. Uh, and if the Shabbat falls on that Rosh Chodesh, uh, then we will have the Shabbat reading, the Rosh Chodesh reading, and the special Hanukkah reading all done on the same day. Uh, and it can also happen, and I'm not sure if it's happening this year, but actually in just two weeks, on Rosh Chodesh Nisan, uh, on the special month, uh, or the, the um, the, the first of the month of Nisan, the month of Passover, uh, where there's uh, the Shabbat, when that happens, is called Shabbat HaChodesh, and it has its own special reading. And if that Shabbat happens to fall on Rosh Chodesh, then there's also those three different readings that you would do. Uh, and, and again, the rule is whatever's uh, done most often is done first. So we would have the Shabbat portion, uh, the Rosh Chodesh portion, and then the special Shabbat HaChodesh portion uh, happening then. Can, can I ask a question? Sure. So hopefully I don't ruffle feathers here, but I want to go back to the conversation earlier in the hour about whether the Torah was written by God or not and what Reformed Jews believe uh, versus Orthodox. So, I mean, as Reformed Jews, you believe that the Torah is valued, it's revered, and the, the, its word is truth, and we study it, and it obviously carries a lot of weight. And at the bottom of this page, on page 370, the, this reading, this is the Torah which Moses placed before the people of Israel, God's word through the hand of Moses. And those words are from Deuteronomy and Numbers, which is part of the Torah. So if, if there's value in what the Torah says, it says right in the Torah that the Torah is written by God's hand through Moses. So mm -hmm. I don't know, just, uh, hopefully that's not disrespectful, but it's just- Oh, no, 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 not to... at all. It, it, that's definitely something that's reflected in our liturgy, this idea of, um, you know, God writing the, or, you know, God saying the Torah, Moses writing it down. Uh, you know, there might be some understandings where, you know, people may who want it both ways, you know, you know, will say that, oh, but, you know, maybe Moses wrote it down incorrectly. So there might be some inconsistencies and things like that. Uh, you know, this understanding that Moses actually wasn't that God, you know, was sitting in the sitting with Moses the, for those 40 days and 40 nights saying, you know, just just dictating. Uh, but God had kind of like gave Moses a sudden inspiration. And then Moses was looking for a pencil for a while and then finally got one and then tried to write everything out that was that God was inspired by or that Moses was inspired by God. But uh, but also an understanding of, a, you know, an academic or, uh, you know, critical look at the Torah is important in progressive Judaism as well. Um, 
And I will say there's not a good answer. It's messy in a lot of ways of having those two parts of progressive Judaism come together. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, you, th there's not a good, uh, you know, that, you know, like this makes sense. It's just kind of this understanding this, uh, you know, two parts of us that are coming together that sometimes might disagree on things. Thank you. No problem. <laughs> well, we, we could always say that it was God inspired. Okay, and, and that's, yeah, that's definitely one of those answers that it was God inspired. And then Moses wrote it down the best as Moses could. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, there, there, there may have been some mistakes uh, as well. So on Shabbat and holidays, we also have another reading, a reading of the Haftorah. Now, although Haftorah in English sounds just like something that's actually related to the word Torah, it makes sense. We have Torah, then we have Haftorah. Haftorah would seem to mean just like, oh, like some additional Torah, but actually uh, they're not, the words are actually not related in Hebrew at all. Uh, Torah means law and is just our understanding. That's what we call the, the first five books of Moses. It's Torah. Half Torah actually comes from the word uh, lahaftir, uh, which means an ending. The last aliyah that we say in the Torah portion is called a maftir, also coming from that root. And half Torah comes from that root, meaning kind of, again, just the noun version of that verb, uh, to, to end is, is really meaning kind of the ending or the, the, the reading that ends. Uh, so although they sound very similar in English or when we, tra or when we would just say them, they're actually two uh, very different words. Uh, but Haftorah is a uh, reading coming from uh, the book of Nevim, or not the book, the section of the Hebrew Bible of Nevim. The Hebrew Bible uh, sometimes referred to as the Tanakh is a collection of three different sections. Uh, the Torah being the first section, the Nevi'im, uh, or the, uh, the prophets being the second section, and the Kituvim, the writings being the third section. Uh, the Psalms uh, and uh, in Ecclesiastes and, you know, kind of the wisdom or poetic literature that comes from the Kituvim, that last section, is, is, is throughout all of the, uh, all of the liturgy. Uh, a lot of the other books from that section will have a special holiday that they'll traditionally be recited. Like the Song of Solomon is recited uh, traditionally over Passover. Uh, the Book of Esther, of course, is recited over Purim. Uh, the Book of Ruth is Shavuot. Uh, Sukkot is, what's Sukkot? Ecclesiastes. Uh, we have like kind of those, uh, those books that have their time to be read throughout the year. But the Book of Prophets, uh, will have different sections that are connected to Torah portions. And there's usually some sort of thematic element between the Torah portion and the half Torah portion that the rabbis developed. I will say that sometimes that connection is a little bit stretching. Uh, I, you know, it's, it's uh, sometimes the half Torah portion, again, it's supposed to have a connection to the Torah portion, bringing up similar themes or ideas. Sometimes that's true. Sometimes, again, it's the rabbis were a little stretching and trying to bring that about. Uh, but uh, it is a part that we definitely read during Shabbat and certain holidays where we have this half Torah portion. Uh, perhaps the most well-known half Torah portion is on Yom Kippur afternoon, uh, where we read the book of uh, Jonah. Uh, one of those prophet books, and that one's read actually in its entirety. Uh, but usually it's not read in its entirety, but just a section of one of those prophetic books, uh, you, you know, starting with the, uh, the book of uh, Joshua, going all the way through um, the 12 minor prophets. And just like uh, the Torah portion, we also have blessings that are coming before and after the half Torah portion. Uh, and there's a different trope, a different way of chanting half Torah than there is Torah. So uh, if, you've, if you've heard these blessings, uh, they sound very similar to how you would chant half Torah. The Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Bachar B'Li Tovihi Bratzav Adibrahim Anam Arim It's, it's... So Ken, you, you are knowing it well, and it, there's something about it, because I remember this when I was studying for my bar mitzvah as well. Um, they said, uh, they asked, 
you know, Ricky chant, uh, chant the half Torah blessings. And I was like, I don't know the half Torah blessings, but the year before in Hebrew school, we chanted them every day. And as soon as I saw it, I was like, oh yeah, it sticks in your head for some reason. So before sixth grade, I teach sixth grade Judaica, but I always chant the half Torah blessings. So hopefully they'll be able to chant them as well when they get to seventh grade <laughs> uh, too. Cause yeah, there's something about it, it sticks in your head. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so that's just a little explanation of half Torah. One more question. Yes. I, I had heard that the origin of the half Torah was because uh, there was a point in, in uh, Jewish history where uh, it was not allowed to read the Torah. I think uh, the Hellenists forbade it. And so a way to get around that was to read the other portions of the, of the Hebrew Bible in place of the Torah. So, so that does make sense. I'm not, I, I mean, there, there was, of course, the, the time uh, it's, you know, the, our Hanukkah story uh, where the Torah was kind of out loud from being, uh, from being read. Um, and, and that might be true that half Torah was kind of, you know, brought in as a way of trying to, to replicate some of the Torah portions. And maybe that's where those connections were made between the half Torah and Torah portions. So you could still read something every week that might have had some thematic connections to the Torah portion. But I don't know for sure. Uh, but after the half Torah, although we've already dressed the Torah, it's now time to put the Torah away. Uh, and we have some, uh, we have some special prayers for that. Uh, so let's go through these. And one, of course, that we'll definitely recognize because our congregation is named after it. Uh, it's Chaim here. But so first we say, let us praise the name of Adonai for God's name alone is exalted. God's majesty is above the earth and heaven, and God is the strength of our people, making God's faithful ones Israel, a people close to the eternal. Hallelujah. And then we return the Torah to the ark, and then we say, for I have given you good instruction, do not abandon my Torah. So even though we're putting it away, we know we're not abandoning it. It is a tree of life for those who hold fast to it, uh, and all of its supporters are happy. Uh, its ways are ways of pleasantness, and all its paths are peace. Return us to you, Adonai, and we will return, renew our days as of old. And of course, we know, uh, uh, I know if, if Ken and Harvey wanted to sing through this, you don't have to, but uh, I know you would be able to, to, to do this one well. Mm -hmm. Uh, so any thoughts just on these, uh, these kind of blessings uh, that we have? Uh, uh, and, and, and an interesting way, not necessarily blessings, but kind of collections of different readings from Psalms or Proverbs, uh, or even, uh, even some in Lamentations here that are put together uh, as a way of kind of praising God. All right. Uh, well, if not, that's okay. Uh, but we can have a little bit of a conversation then on the sermon. So usually uh, in pretty much any congregation that you would go to after the Torah service is done, uh, that's when you're going to have a sermon. Uh, and I'm here to say, we were talking about this with Alan a little bit earlier today, that the sermon as a kind of a moral understanding or teaching is something that is pretty new in Judaism for the service, for the tefillah service. Um, it's, it was kind of uh, modeled after the, the Protestant sermon that happened in Protestant services uh, in kind of Central Europe during the 19th century, uh, when the early reformers were kind of thinking about things that they wanted to add to the service, said, we want something like that as well, uh, and uh, we'll, this, is, this is the good time to do it. Uh, and, you know, kind of a thought or, you know, a devar Torah uh, and as Alan pointed out a little bit earlier today that we were talking, perhaps the actual sermon was in itself a modification of a Devar Torah or a thought, a, a moral thought brought out from the Torah portion that week. Uh, just traditionally, that wouldn't be done in the prayer service, but would be done in the Beit Midrash, in the house of study, not in the Beit Tefillah, the house of prayer. Uh, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, the, um, the two sermons that were done uh, by the rabbi throughout the year traditionally were really just sermons that said, here's how to get your house ready for different holidays. Uh, definitely the big one happening over Passover, uh, but there's also one that would have been done uh, before uh, the high holidays as well. 
question, Rabbi. What, wasn't there a Devar Torah that was given after the Torah reading by the rabbi or someone to extend and basically function as to make relevant the Torah portion to everyday life or so, so something there, else? So there could have been, yeah, a, a little Devar Torah, a little Torah thought, but the idea of an actually a, a sermon, a kind of argument that was given by the rabbi, whomever in the congregation, uh, to the, uh, you know, to, to everyone that was more than just kind of a thought or element that says, here's something that we can learn from the Torah portion. Anything that was expounded more upon, again, was kind of done more in that Beit Midrash, uh, was really coming from the Protestant tradition about 150 years ago, uh, that then became part of kind of all more kind of progressive Judaism. But, but you're right, there still is an element, there, there's something there that was done, the Devar Torah, um, but as a, as a whole sermon, that's, that's a newer kind of, uh, uh, a newer element to the prayer service. But one that I wanted to connect to the Torah service uh, as well, uh, you know, perhaps an understanding that uh, like the Misha Berach, the rabbi wants to make sure that that sermon is, is, is well received. So at the time of this, this height of the service as well. <laughs> so if you go to a traditional service today, do you expect to hear a sermon? Depends. So like in the conservative synagogue that I worked in, there was always a sermon. Uh, I'm trying to think in the, in the Orthodox ones that I've been to, I have not really heard anything too big when it came to sermon, but that might be, there might be some that do, and that just wasn't one that was, that was doing it. I'm, so I'm not, I'm not sure. In the Orthodox congregation that I grew up in, it wasn't so much um, a, a standalone sermon as it was that the rabbi um, would translate what he had just read and add thoughts to it, mm -hmm. okay? Um, sometimes relevant to what was going on at the time other times, literally random thoughts, mm -hmm. uh, but not so much what we would think of as a, as a sermon. Yeah. So si since COVID, we've gotten very orthodox because we don't have sermons with our services anymore. No, they're usually quick stories. It's, 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 I, I understand it's tough to do a sermon over Zoom. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, yeah, that's, that's definitely something, uh, I mean, it's easy to tune out in person. If you have your computer right there, it's, it's, it's very tough, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> were they, when they gave sermons before, were they always the same sermons then every single year, how to get ready for Passover? So they'd have definitely similar parts to them, yes, but, uh, but I don't know if they were the exact same. There might be some elements that were bought in for, for New Year's that, that might, bought, might have bought in some sort of current events that were happening if they affected the cash root of your, of your house for Passover. So uh, how can I, what about the, uh, the sermon itself? How much freedom do you as a, as a rabbi have to write your sermon? And how much guidance are you given from above? So good question. And, and it, it depends on the week. It depends on the tour portion. Uh, it depends what's going on. Sometimes there's obviously something that's happening in the world that you want to address. And you'll find a link to a portion coming from that current event. Sometimes you'll find something in the Torah portion that's really worth kind of delving into and you'll get your idea that way. Um, so, so it kind of depends. There's, you know, we take a homiletics class in rabbinical school uh, and, you know, the, the, you know, it's everything's, and if, if you notice, it's, uh, uh, you know, everything's always in threes. Uh, and my homiletics professor used to say, well, why is that? And he would say, because two is too few and four is too many. And that's, that's kind of the, 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 the understanding that we have. We want to do things in threes. Um, so whether it's a three-point argument or, uh, uh, you know, what's, uh, some of the other ones is the um, problem solution implication where you address a problem, you give a solution, and then you tell, you know, the, those are actually the ones that I do probably the most often is I'll talk about a problem, the, the solution to that, and the implication if we do that solution. Uh, another one is the um, thesis, antithesis, thesis, antithesis, uh, con consensus uh, is, is, is another one, but there's, yeah, always in threes. <laughs> 
Synthesis, thank you. You're right, not consensus, synthesis. <laughs> you're, you're lucky you didn't um, have the opportunity to listen to some of Rabbi Bob's uh, ramblings. <laughs> there, there was no other way to describe it. Baseball. <laughs> oh, yes. Baseball had a definite theme. <laughs> that was usually his beginning. He never knew where it would lead, but that was usually his beginning. <laughs> and, and always, that's always a trick, uh, yeah, of, of starting off a sermon with a joke, a story, or, or some way of connecting with everyone to kind of start bringing in the themes of whatever it is that you want to say. Oh, I just heard a good joke. Um, oh, okay, so it's... Um, so there are two people in the synagogue, hopefully trying to get a minion for uh, for that uh, for that day, uh, a minion of ten Jewish people, so that they can have the service. Uh, and they say, "How are we going to get a minion?" Let's say it's a snowstorm, just like it was a couple nights ago. Uh, they know no one's going to come, uh, so they say, "Okay, well, here's what we do: we get some mirrors and we put them we put them in front of us. So windows. So first." First we say you and me equals two, but that means if you and me equals two, then us is two of us. So if there's two of us, then two us is, in us is two. So if, if there's two of us, that means there's actually four because we have two of us. Uh, and if we bring in a mirror for us, that's gonna give us uh, to six. I don't remember exactly how it got to six, uh, but then if we bring in another mirror, we'll double it up and we'll be 12. And then as soon as we're 12, then you and I can actually go to the bar because the 10 that are already here, they'll take care of us. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, fun little joke. Anyway, <laughs> so then I could say a sermon. Uh, <laughs> uh, but so, uh, so Alan, anything that you have to add? Because I think actually that's that's all pretty much that I tonight. <laughs> we're losing you. Oh, I wondered sorry. why we don't do the Haftorah and what the status of the Haftorah is compared to the Torah. So good question. So, so we do do the Haftorah on Saturday mornings. We don't do it on Friday evenings. Now, traditionally, Torah is really only read on Saturday mornings, not on Friday evenings. But in the Reform Movement, Friday night kind of became the big Shabbat uh, time. So Torah was added to that, but Haftorah not as much. Uh, Torah is also traditionally read more throughout the week. We would read traditionally Torah on Monday morning, Thursday morning, and Saturday morning and Saturday afternoon. But Haftorah is only traditionally read on Saturday mornings. Uh, it's, it's not done on the, on the other days when you read Torah. Uh, it's just something special for Shabbat or for some holidays. Uh, so it's just not something kind of even a traditional calendar, it's just not something that's done as often. I have a question for everyone. I wonder input. I think about the term Eitz Chaim and it's a metaphor, obviously, but I don't see where it plays in because we are not nurtured by trees. What is the metaphor in, other, in everyone's opinion? Actually, I, I think that if you consider the image that's on the wall in, in the lobby, um, that that which is the root of our faith feeds all of the branches and, and thereupon the leaves that, that grow. So it's, yeah, that metaphor of, of a tree, uh, including life, all of life, our family, our friends, and everybody who's connected. It's a nice explanation. Yeah, and, and I always like the tree is this idea, of course, having the roots, I think, like you mentioned, Harvey, this idea of we're coming from, you know, the stronger the tree, the stronger the roots. Uh, but also, no matter how tall we grow, we're still building on what came before us. And in fact, it, it's the, the taller we grow, it's dependent on what became before us. 
and the branching our future, our generations that are continuing and, and mm -hmm. dividing, I guess, and going forward, going on. Mm -hmm. And the Torah is the roots, I take it. Yeah. The Torah and history, mm -hmm. peoplehood, etc. Leaves can be cycle of life as well, because leaves are formed and then leaves fall, but there are new mm -hmm. ones that are in their place. Mm -hmm. There's also a literal understanding to it as well. Uh, the the eights is also what's referred to as the wood handles of the Torah, which is actually what you would grasp. So when you're grasping a Torah, uh, it's Chaim, for those who hold fast to it, are the ones that are actually holding onto that eights, onto that uh, onto that tree. Oh. I, I actually, I, I it, this is the case where, although there is a literal understanding of it, I, it's the metaphor one that I like much better. I think. But, uh, Thank yeah, you. and I think that uh, nobody would join the bush of life <laughs> or the shrub of life. <laughs> the shrub of even life. Even the weed of life. Tree of life sounds much more <laughs> promising. <laughs> How about the sequoia of life? <laughs> Take that a go. <laughs> Uh, well, good. Um, so, so as I said, that's that, that's really all I had prepared today. We got to look through a little bit quicker today, but that's okay. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, if, if any uh, other questions, but if not, I think that we can say, uh, Lila Tov, and uh, this was great. I'll put it up on the on our YouTube page so that we can uh, we can see it. But any questions that you have, uh, even if you don't think uh, tonight, just uh, happy to email, call, whatever it is uh, for me, and always happy to answer. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Stay well, everyone. Yes. Yep. Bye -bye. Stay well.